So let's start out by taking a look at the very beginning of this second movement of resounding earth. Here it is, uh, the key to the left here for the third player, uh, with tunings for the Japanese ring bells, or the singing holes, and the portales. And then we have this first opening gesture of four pitches. And we see some characteristics of Gusty's writing already, the real exquisite attentiveness to gesture, to shape, to the envelope of a particular uh, musical figure, here indicated by the dynamics, the contour, and so forth. Um, in a music analysis class, one would often take this notated artifact as sort of the principal point of departure and look at intervals among these pitches and so forth. Uh, but these are not normal pitches by any stretch. Uh, the first thing to recognize, and uh, Augusti mentions this in her score, is that the performers are instructed to let all the bells vibrate, to create a resonance, uh, which is not indicated in the score uh, for obvious reasons. But nevertheless, there is a kind of a cumulative effect to this gesture and all the ones that follow that is not reflected in the notation. Even more striking is the particular way these pitches sound when played on the bell. So let's hear it. I hope it's loud enough. All right. So we begin with this middle C, that notated middle C, that sounds very little like the kind of middle C that we would have on the piano, for example. And here we will see why that is. So here I've placed side by side spectrograms. On the one hand, this is our bell middle C, and this is a piano middle C. All right? The distinction is, for all pitched sounds that we hear, we, unless it's a sine tone or some synthetically produced sound, we hear not only a fundamental frequency, but a series of partials. For many traditional instruments, these partials approximate what we call the harmonic series. That is, if you see the piano there, you know the regularity with how they're spaced in terms of frequency. Each higher partial is a whole number multiple of the fundamental. So this is about 260, as it turns out. This is the fundamental C. This is about 520, and so forth. Times 2, times 3, times 4, times 5, all the way up. Bells are some of the most famously inharmonic instruments that we have. They also have spectra, but they are inharmonic spectra, which is to say the partials do not line up with the harmonic series. And you can see that visually very clearly right here. Uh, notice we have almost no coincidence between any of these lines and any of those, with the exception of the vanishingly weak fundamental here. Um, I'll play both just so you can hear them. You'll hear the bell tone first, and then a, a piano middle C. Alright, it's very short. I, I had to get a recording so that, I don't know if anyone can, knows the piece. It's the first fugue of the well-tempered clavier. Uh, Edward Aldwell. Um, and he plays it faster than I wanted to, so the note's over too quick. Um, but in any case, let's listen again. So this already gives you some of the contrast. Uh, we've got a long, had a long the left side there. The frequencies are very hard to read. It's a little easier if I show you what the note names are of these. So here we see this is the harmonic series. These are approximate. Any acoustic instrument in the real world, uh, in all of its messy empirical reality, has various small inharmonicities to it. But this is more or less what we get out of that piano tone. Uh, so, those of you who know about this, the first six of these are giving us a C major chord, and then gradually it gets more and more closely compressed. Uh, here's what we have for the first bell. One interesting thing to notice is only eight partials are shown here. We have 16 I've labeled for the uh, piano tone. And moreover, these are not giving us anything like the harmonic spectrum that we're used to seeing. The first and very early prominent 
upper partial, which is the second partial, is F sharp, F sharp 5. There's another F sharp up here, F sharp 7. And then we have various partials that uh, differ from equal temperament in one way or another, a slightly sharp E6 and sharp C7 and so forth, all the way up to these. Essentially, I mean, very difficult to, to pick out G sharp 8 and E8. The uh, highest note on the piano is C8 for reference. Let's listen again. All right. This time when I play it, I would like you to focus your ears in particular on F sharp, the F sharpness of this bell, especially. See if you can hear this. There's the bell. There's the piano. Very strong tritone flavor to this. So the fascinating thing is what happens once Gusty sets these in motion within the piece, and indeed just in this opening phrase of four events, this incredible overlapping of inharmonic spectra occurs. So here is this opening gesture. so widely spaced, it's actually quite a bit easier for us to tease out orally some of those partials. For any number of reasons, we tend to fuse together the partials in a harmonic spectrum. Uh, and there are all sorts of psychoacoustic reasons for that. But these often stick out in these really striking ways. So one of the first that I notice in my hearing is that strong F sharp at the beginning of the first bell is then going to be echoed by an actual F-sharp bell. This is the fundamental of that bell. If you recall the gesture, it was notated C, B, A, F-sharp. And so listen to a strand that's going to follow along here, and I will label the pitches. The first thing is this. to the next voice, so to speak, in this uh, spectral stack here, and that is this one right here, where we're going to have a somewhat sharp E that's going to be taken over by an F. So here. This range, more or less. proximity of the two. Uh, I should also say that you notice beating elsewhere in this. There's beating going on just by itself right here with this particular pitch. And this gets into aspects of the acoustics of bells that I don't understand well enough to speak authoritatively about them. As far as I know, it has to do with interference in the modes of vibration of a single bell. Uh, usually we encounter beats when we have two sounding instruments or pitches that are close together. If you're tuning a guitar, this happens all the time. Here you can get it in individual bells as well. So the next strand I'd like us to focus on is that one, which starts with this slowly beating, slightly sharp B, which is up here. And then it's going to go down to that solid line B. Our little survey here. 
some of these strings. Now there are other higher partials too, but I have a very hard time hearing them. I also have tinnitus, which should have them default right about in that register. So some of you might have more sensitive hearing than I do. Uh, basically, though, what I wanted to draw out is we have this surprisingly complex phenomenon here, an almost harmonic phenomenon going on with these different strands. And here I'll just play it one more time so we can see. So now I'll just wrap up with a couple comments of a more uh, uh, interpretive nature. In Augusto's own introductory comments to the score and in Bob's comments to begin, uh, the sort of metaphorics of harmony is something that easily enters into a discussion like this. Metaphors of resonance, of resounding, of a kind of harmonic agreement. Um, and one of the things I find fascinating about the piece as we transition from looking at a notated score in all of its uh, symbolic austerity and simplicity to the rather uh, overwhelmingly complex world of the real, of the acoustic, of the sonic, that there is a move here into a realm of inharmonicity, where I think there is an interesting metaphor to be drawn between Let's say, on the one hand, think of a per percussionist playing one of these bells. There is an initial motion to hit the bell, and then the bell resounds, and the percussionist is simply to let it vibrate. And it goes out into the world and continues as it will. Similarly, a composer is going to compose a piece with certain ideas in mind, certain compositional aesthetics, and then that piece is received by people in this room, by those in the concert, and so forth. And while there might, might be certain ideas about a kind of harmonic agreement, uh, it's fascinating to see the various ways in which these resonances might create certain inharmonicities among some of the people who receive them, some of the other cultures with which they come into contact, some of the other individual listening temperaments and uh, personal corpora that people encounter them with. And I imagine we're going to be hearing more about that kind of thing in the coming talk. So I will. Thank you.